I had always wanted to go camping in Rhode Island, the best state for camping according to some website. I heard it had beautiful scenery, diverse wildlife, and zero accidents or crimes in its national parks. So when I got a chance to visit Susquecentennial State Park, I was thrilled. It was a large park with over 1,400 acres of land, a 30-acre lake, and several trails and campsites. I decided to pitch my tent near the lake, where I could enjoy the view and the sound of water. The first night was peaceful and relaxing. I made a fire, roasted some marshmallows, and gazed at the stars. I felt like I was in heaven. I crawled into my sleeping bag and fell asleep with a smile on my face. The second night was a different story. I woke up to a loud noise outside my tent. It sounded like something heavy was dragging across the ground. I grabbed my flashlight and peeked out of the zipper. To my horror, I saw a huge, hairy creature with glowing red eyes and sharp teeth. It was a bear, and it was tearing apart my cooler and backpack. It looked angry and hungry, and it was heading towards my tent. I panicked and tried to unzip the tent and run, but it was too late. The bear noticed me and charged at me with a roar. I screamed and threw my flashlight at it, hoping to scare it away. But it only made it angrier. It ripped through the tent fabric and lunged at me. I felt its claws and teeth digging into my flesh. I felt a surge of pain and fear. I knew I was going to die. I don't know how long it lasted, but it felt like an eternity. The bear finally stopped mauling me and dragged me out of the tent. It dragged me towards the lake, where it probably wanted to finish me off. I was bleeding profusely and losing consciousness. I could barely see or hear anything. I could only feel the cold water on my skin and the bear's grip on my body. I thought about my life and how I had wasted it. I wished I had done more things, seen more places, met more people. I wished I had told my family and friends how much I loved them. I wished I had never gone camping in Rhode Island. I wished I had never seen that bear. I closed my eyes and waited for the end. But it never came. Instead, I heard a loud bang and a splash. I opened my eyes and saw the bear's head explode in a shower of blood and brains. I saw a man with a rifle standing on the shore, aiming at the bear. He had shot it and saved me. He was a park ranger, and he had heard my screams. He ran towards me and pulled me out of the water. He wrapped me in a blanket and called for help. He told me I was going to be okay. He told me I was lucky to be alive. I don't remember much after that. I passed out and woke up in a hospital. I had multiple injuries and infections, but I survived. I spent several weeks recovering and undergoing therapy. I had nightmares and flashbacks but I also had gratitude and hope. I had a second chance at life, and I wasn't going to waste it. I never went camping again, though. I learned my lesson. Camping is not for me. Camping is scary. I had always wanted to go camping in the woods, so when my friend invited me to join him for a weekend trip, I agreed without hesitation. He said he knew a great spot in South Carolina, at Sesquicentennial State Park. He said it was one of the best states for camping, with plenty of trails, wildlife, and scenery to enjoy. We arrived at the park on a Friday afternoon, and set up our tent at a campsite near the lake. The park was huge, covering over 1,400 acres of land. There were other campers around, but not too many. We had enough privacy and space to feel like we were in the wilderness. The campsite was clean and well-maintained, with access to water, toilets, and fire pits. We unpacked our gear, made a fire, and cooked some hot dogs and marshmallows. It was a perfect evening, and we talked and laughed until the stars came out. The next day, we decided to explore the park and do some hiking. We packed some snacks, water, and a map, and headed to the nearest trailhead. The park had over 12 miles of trails, ranging from easy to moderate. We chose a loop trail that circled the lake and promised to offer some scenic views. The trail was well marked and easy to follow, and we enjoyed the fresh air and the sounds of nature. We saw some birds, squirrels, and deer along the way, but nothing too exciting. 
We stopped at a picnic area by the lake and ate our lunch. The lake was calm and clear, reflecting the blue sky and the green trees. It was a beautiful sight, and we took some pictures to remember it. We continued our hike and soon reached the other side of the lake. The trail became more wooded and secluded, and we didn't see any other hikers. We felt like we had the park to ourselves, and we liked it. We joked and sang songs, and had a good time. We didn't notice how late it was getting, until we saw the sun starting to set behind the trees. We checked our map, and realized we still had a few miles to go before we reached our campsite. We quickened our pace, hoping to make it back before dark. We were almost there, when we heard a loud noise in the bushes. It sounded like something big and heavy, crashing through the branches. We stopped and looked around, trying to see what it was. We hoped it was just a deer, or maybe a bear. We had heard that there were some black bears in the park, but they were usually shy and harmless. We didn't see anything, but we heard it again, closer this time. It sounded like it was coming towards us fast. We panicked and ran. We didn't know what else to do. We ran as fast as we could, following the trail, hoping to reach our campsite, or any sign of civilization. We heard it behind us, getting closer and closer. We didn't dare to look back, but we could feel its presence, its breath, its growl. We screamed, but no one heard us. We were alone, and we were prey. We ran until we couldn't run anymore. We tripped and fell, and rolled down a slope. We landed on the ground, bruised and bleeding. We looked up and saw it. It was a wolf, but not like any wolf we had ever seen. It was huge, bigger than a bear, with black fur and red eyes. It had long, sharp teeth and claws, and a scarred face. It looked like a monster, a nightmare, a beast. It looked at us, and we looked at it. We knew we were going to die. It lunged at us, and we closed our eyes. We waited for the pain, the blood, the end. But it never came. Instead, we heard a gunshot and a thud. We opened our eyes and saw the wolf lying on the ground, motionless. A bullet hole in its head. We looked around and saw a man standing over us, holding a rifle. He was wearing a park ranger uniform and had a badge on his chest. He looked at us and smiled. Are you guys okay? He asked. You're lucky I was patrolling this area. That thing has been killing campers for weeks. I've been trying to track it down, but it's been too smart and too fast. Until now. I finally got it. It's over. You're safe. We couldn't believe it. We were alive. We were saved. We thanked the ranger and hugged him. He helped us up and led us to his truck. He drove us to our campsite and checked our wounds. He said we were fine, just some cuts and bruises. He said he would report the incident. He said we should pack our stuff and leave the park as soon as possible. We agreed. We packed our stuff and left the park. We never went camping again. I had always wanted to hike the Skyline Trail in Washington, one of the best hiking trails in the state. It was a 5.5 mile loop that traversed the mountain meadows, babbling brooks, and surreal alpine environment of Mount Rainier National Park. I decided to go solo, since none of my friends were available or interested in joining me. I packed my backpack with the essentials, water, snacks, extra layers, sunscreen, bug repellent, map, and compass. I also brought a small tent and a sleeping bag, just in case I wanted to spend the night at one of the designated campsites along the trail. I started my hike early in the morning, hoping to avoid the crowds and enjoy the scenery at my own pace. The trail was well marked and easy to follow, and I soon found myself immersed in the beauty of nature. I saw wildflowers of every color, marmots sunning themselves on rocks, and glaciers sparkling in the distance. I felt a surge of joy and gratitude, and I snapped some photos with my phone to capture the moment. I reached the highest point of the trail, Panorama Point, around noon. I stopped there for a lunch break, admiring the stunning views of Mount Rainier and the surrounding peaks. I noticed a few other hikers on the trail, 
but they were far enough away that I still felt like I had the place to myself. I ate my sandwich and drank some water, feeling refreshed and energized. I checked my map and saw that I had about half of the loop left to complete. I decided to continue hiking, hoping to finish the trail by late afternoon. The second half of the trail was more challenging than the first. It descended steeply into a valley, where I had to cross a few streams and navigate some rocky terrain. The trail then climbed back up to another ridge, where I encountered some snow patches and icy sections. I had to be careful not to slip or lose my balance, and I used my trekking poles for extra stability. I was glad I had brought my extra layers, as the temperature dropped and the wind picked up. I checked my phone and saw that it was already 4 p.m. I realized that I had underestimated the difficulty and length of the trail, and that I might not make it back to the trailhead before dark. I started to panic a little, but I tried to calm myself down. I told myself that I still had enough daylight to finish the trail, and that I could always camp at one of the sites if I had to. I quickened my pace, hoping to cover more ground. I followed the trail markers, which were wooden posts with arrows pointing the way. I saw a sign that said Campsite 3, and I considered stopping there for the night, but I decided to push on. I thought I could make it to the next campsite, which was closer to the trailhead, and then decide what to do. I regretted that decision as soon as I left Campsite 3. The trail became harder to follow, as the snow and ice covered the markers and the path. I had to rely on my map and compass, but I was not very good at orienteering. I soon realized that I had taken a wrong turn, and that I was heading away from the trail. I tried to backtrack, but I couldn't find the trail again. I was lost. I felt a surge of fear and despair, and I started to panic. I looked at my phone and saw that it had no signal and low battery. I had no way of calling for help or using GPS. I was alone, in the middle of nowhere, with no idea where to go. I looked at the sky and saw that it was getting dark. I knew I had to find a place to shelter for the night, or I would freeze to death. I wandered around, looking for a spot to pitch my tent. I saw a clearing in the trees, and I headed towards it. I hoped it was a campsite, or at least a flat and dry area. As I got closer, I saw something that made my blood run cold. It was a pile of bones. I stopped in my tracks, staring at the gruesome sight. The bones were scattered all over the clearing, some of them charred and blackened. They looked like they belonged to animals, but I couldn't tell what kind. I saw skulls, ribs, spines, and limbs. I also saw some metal objects, like cans, pots, and knives. It looked like someone had killed and cooked the animals, and then left their remains behind. I wondered who had done this, and why. I wondered if they were still around, and if they would come back. I felt a chill run down my spine, and I heard a rustle in the bushes. I turned around, and I saw a pair of glowing eyes staring at me. They belonged to a large, hairy creature, with long claws and sharp teeth. It looked like a cross between a bear and a wolf, but bigger and more terrifying. It growled at me, and I knew it was hungry. It was the predator that had killed and eaten the animals, and now it wanted me. I screamed, and I ran. I dropped my backpack and my poles, and I ran as fast as I could. I didn't care where I was going, I just wanted to get away from the monster. I heard it chase after me its heavy footsteps and angry snarls getting closer and closer. I knew I couldn't outrun it, and I knew I was going to die. I reached the edge of a cliff, and I stopped. I had nowhere to go. I looked down, and I saw a steep drop and jagged rocks. I looked back, and I saw the creature closing in on me. When it was only a few feet away from me, I got out of the way, and it fell down. This experience still scares me. I ran away from the cliff, and finally found my way back to the trail after a while, and then hiked back. I had always wanted to hike the Skyline Trail in Washington, one of the best hiking trails in the country. It was a 5.5 mile loop that traversed the mountain meadows, babbling brooks, and surreal alpine environment of Mount Rainier National Park. I decided to go solo, 
since none of my friends were available or interested in joining me. I packed my backpack with the essentials, water, snacks, extra layers, sunscreen, bug repellent, and a map. I also brought a small tent and a sleeping bag, in case I wanted to spend the night at the park's only campground, the Bartlett Cove Campground. It was a primitive campsite with no amenities, but it offered a stunning view of the glacier and the lake. I started my hike early in the morning, hoping to avoid the crowds and enjoy the scenery at my own pace. The trail was well marked and easy to follow, and I soon found myself immersed in the beauty of nature. I saw wildflowers of every color, marmots and pikas scurrying among the rocks, and even a black bear grazing in the distance. I felt a surge of adrenaline and awe as I approached the highest point of the trail, at 7,402 feet, where I could see the majestic peak of Mount Rainier looming over me. I took a few photos and a deep breath, feeling proud of myself for making it this far. I decided to continue the loop and head back to the campground, where I planned to set up my tent and relax for the evening. I figured I had enough time to finish the hike before sunset and I was looking forward to a peaceful night under the stars. I followed the trail downhill, enjoying the changing scenery and the cool breeze. I crossed a small stream and entered a dense forest, where the light was dimmer and the air was quieter. I felt a slight chill, but I shrugged it off and kept walking. That's when I heard it. A low growl, coming from behind me. I turned around and saw a large, dark shape moving through the trees. It was a cougar and it was stalking me. I felt a surge of fear and panic, and I remembered the advice I had read online, don't run, don't turn your back, make yourself look big, and fight back if attacked. I grabbed a branch from the ground and waved it in the air, trying to scare the animal away. I shouted and screamed, hoping to attract some help or deter the predator. But it didn't work. The cougar kept coming closer, its eyes fixed on me, its muscles tense and ready to pounce. I backed away slowly, keeping my eyes on the cougar, hoping to find a way out. But I soon realized I was trapped. The trail was narrow and steep, and I had nowhere to go. The cougar was faster and stronger than me, and I knew I didn't stand a chance. I felt a wave of despair and resignation, and I wondered if anyone would ever find me. I closed my eyes and braced myself for the inevitable. But then, something unexpected happened. I heard a loud bang, followed by another growl, this time of pain and surprise. I opened my eyes and saw the cougar lying on the ground, bleeding from a wound on its chest. Next to it, I saw a man holding a rifle, looking at me with a mix of concern and relief. He was a park ranger, and he had heard my screams and came to my rescue. He told me to stay calm and that everything was going to be okay. He radioed for backup and asked me if I was hurt. I shook my head, still in shock, and thanked him profusely. He smiled and said he was just doing his job. He helped me get to the campground, where I was checked by a medic and given a warm blanket and a cup of tea. He told me I was very lucky, and that cougars rarely attack humans, but they can be unpredictable and dangerous. He said I should always hike with a buddy, and carry a whistle and a pepper spray for protection. He said he was sorry for ruining my hiking experience but I told him he had saved my life and that I was grateful beyond words. I spent the night at the campground, feeling safe and thankful. I decided to cut my trip short and go home the next day, where I would tell my friends and family about my adventure. I realized I had learned a valuable lesson. Nature can be beautiful and awe-inspiring, but also wild and unforgiving. I still loved hiking, but I would never go solo again. I would always respect and appreciate the power and mystery of the outdoors, and never take it for granted. I had always wanted to hike the Appalachian Trail, ever since I read about it in a magazine. I lived in Vermont, one of the best states for hiking, and I had a week off from work in October. I decided to go solo, since none of my friends were available or interested. I packed my backpack with the essentials, tent, sleeping bag, stove, food, water, map, compass, flashlight, knife, and bear spray. I also brought my phone, but I knew the reception would be spotty at best. 
I drove to the trailhead near Killington and parked my car. I checked the weather forecast, which looked clear and sunny for the next few days. I signed the register, put on my backpack, and started walking. The trail was well marked and easy to follow. I enjoyed the crisp air, the colorful leaves, and the occasional views of the mountains. I felt free and happy. I planned to hike about 15 miles a day and camp at designated sites along the way. The first day went smoothly, and I reached the Stony Brook shelter by late afternoon. It was a wooden lean-to with a fire pit and a picnic table. There were a few other hikers there, and we chatted and shared stories over a campfire. I slept well that night, feeling safe and cozy in my sleeping bag. The next day, I woke up early and resumed my hike. I passed by several scenic spots, such as the Thundering Falls, the Kent Pond, and the Gifford Woods State Park. I stopped for lunch at a clearing with a view of the Pico Peak. I took some pictures and posted them on social media, hoping to make my friends jealous. I had a few bars of signal, and I checked my messages and emails. Nothing important, just some spam and ads. I turned off my phone and continued hiking. I reached the Cooper Lodge shelter by late afternoon. It was a stone hut with a metal roof and a wooden door. It looked old and sturdy but also dark and gloomy. There was no one else there, and I felt a chill run down my spine. I decided to pitch my tent outside, near a small stream. I cooked some dinner and ate it quickly. I didn't feel like making a fire or staying up late. I crawled into my tent and zipped it up. I tried to fall asleep, but I couldn't. I heard strange noises outside, like rustling, snapping, and growling. I told myself it was just the wind, or some animals, or my imagination. I closed my eyes and prayed for dawn. I woke up to a loud thud. It sounded like something heavy had fallen on my tent. I screamed and grabbed my flashlight and knife. I turned on the flashlight and pointed it at the source of the noise. I saw a large, hairy, clawed hand pressing down on the fabric of my tent. It was a bear, and it was trying to get in. I panicked and stabbed the hand with my knife. The bear roared and pulled back its hand. I heard it circling around my tent, sniffing and snorting. I reached for my bear spray, but I realized I had left it in my backpack, which was outside my tent. I cursed myself for being so stupid. I was trapped, and I had no way to defend myself. I heard the bear rip open my backpack and rummage through my stuff. It must have smelled my food and water. I hoped it would be satisfied and leave me alone. But then I heard it come back to my tent. It pawed at the zipper, trying to open it. I kicked at it, hoping to scare it away. But it only made it angrier. It tore open the zipper with its teeth and poked its head inside. I saw its black eyes, wet nose, and sharp teeth. It growled and lunged at me. I screamed and stabbed it in the face with my knife. It bit down on my arm and I felt a surge of pain. I stabbed it again, and again, and again. It let go of my arm and backed away. It looked wounded and confused. It shook its head and ran away. I heard it crashing through the woods until it was gone. I was bleeding profusely from my arm. I felt dizzy and weak. I grabbed my phone and turned it on. I had no signal. I was alone, and I needed help. I crawled out of my tent and looked around. I saw my backpack, torn and scattered. I saw my food and water, spilled and spoiled. I saw my map and compass, ripped and useless. I saw the trail, winding and endless. I felt hopeless and scared. I wrapped my arm with a piece of cloth and tied it with a string. I tried to stop the bleeding, but it didn't help much. I knew I had to get to the nearest road or town, or I would die. I packed what I could in my backpack and put it on. I left my tent and sleeping bag behind, too heavy to carry. I started walking, following the trail. I didn't know how far I had to go, or if I would make it. I walked for hours, feeling faint and thirsty. I saw no signs of civilization, or other hikers, or even animals. I felt like I was in a nightmare, and I couldn't wake up. I don't know how long I walked and finally found my way back. This was the scariest experience of my life, and thankfully I survived.
I always loved camping, especially in Wyoming, the best state for camping according to some websites. I had heard about a place called Wilson State Park, where there was a beautiful lake and a lot of wildlife. I decided to go there for a weekend, alone, just to enjoy the peace and quiet of nature. I arrived at the park on a Friday afternoon and found a nice spot near the water. The park was not very crowded, and I only saw a few other campers in the distance. I set up my tent, made a fire, and cooked some dinner. The sun was setting and the sky was painted with orange and purple hues. I felt relaxed and happy. I decided to go for a walk along the shore to stretch my legs and see the stars. The night was clear and cool, and the moon was bright. I could hear the gentle waves and the crickets chirping. I walked for about half an hour until I reached a small pier. I decided to sit there for a while and enjoy the view. As I was sitting on the pier, I noticed something moving in the water. It looked like a large fish, or maybe a turtle. I leaned over the edge, trying to get a better look. Suddenly, I felt a sharp pain in my ankle, as if something had bitten me. I screamed and pulled my leg back, but it was too late. I saw blood dripping from a deep wound, and a dark shape swimming away. I panicked and ran back to my campsite, limping and bleeding. I grabbed my first aid kit and tried to bandage my wound but it was bleeding too much. I needed to get to a hospital fast. I looked at my phone, but there was no signal. I remembered that there was a ranger station a few miles away, on the other side of the park. I decided to get in my car and drive there, hoping that someone would be there to help me. I got in my car and started the engine, but nothing happened. The car was dead. I checked the battery and saw that it had been chewed by some animal. I cursed and got out of the car, feeling dizzy and weak. I looked around and saw that my tent had been torn apart and my food had been scattered. Something had attacked my campsite while I was gone. I realized that I had no choice but to walk to the ranger station, even though it was dark and I was injured. I grabbed a flashlight and a knife and started walking. I followed the road, hoping that it would lead me to safety. I tried to ignore the pain and the blood loss and focus on my goal. As I was walking, I heard a loud roar behind me. I turned around and saw a huge bear running towards me. It had blood on its mouth and claws, and it looked angry and hungry. It was the same animal that had bitten me and attacked my campsite. It had followed me, and now it wanted to finish me off. I ran as fast as I could and somehow got away from it and made it to the ranger station safely. I always loved camping, especially in the wilderness. There was something about being away from the city, surrounded by nature, that made me feel alive. That's why I decided to go on a solo camping trip in Wyoming, one of the best states for camping according to some websites. I wanted to experience the beauty and solitude of the Rocky Mountains, and maybe catch a glimpse of some wildlife. I packed my car with all the essentials, a tent, a sleeping bag, a stove, some food, water, a flashlight, a knife, and a map. I also brought my camera, hoping to take some amazing photos of the scenery. I drove for hours, following the directions to a campsite near a lake that was recommended by a friend. He said it was a hidden gem, not very crowded, and perfect for fishing and hiking. I arrived at the campsite in the late afternoon, and found a spot near the edge of the lake. There were only a few other tents around, and I didn't see anyone outside. I guess they were either out exploring or inside resting. I set up my tent and then decided to take a walk around the lake before it got dark. I grabbed my camera and headed out, leaving my car and tent behind. The lake was stunning, reflecting the colors of the sky and the mountains. I snapped some photos and then followed a trail that led to a small waterfall. I was amazed by the sound and sight of the water cascading down the rocks. I took more photos and then sat on a log, enjoying the view. I felt so peaceful and relaxed, I almost forgot about the time. I checked my watch and realized it was getting late. I decided to head back to the campsite and maybe cook some dinner. I got up from the log and turned around. That's when I saw him. 
He was standing on the other side of the waterfall, staring at me. He was tall and thin, wearing a dirty backpack and a ragged coat. He had long, greasy hair and a scruffy beard. His eyes were dark and hollow, and his mouth was twisted into a grin. He was holding a hatchet in his hand. I felt a surge of fear and wondered who he was and what he wanted. I didn't recognize him from the campsite, and I didn't see any tent or car nearby. He looked like a drifter, or maybe a fugitive. He didn't say anything, he just kept staring and grinning. I tried to act calm, and said hello. He didn't respond, he just tilted his head, as if he was amused by my greeting. I asked him if he was camping here, and if he needed any help. He still didn't answer, he just raised his hatchet, and pointed it at me. I felt a chill run down my spine, and realized he was dangerous. He was probably crazy, or high, or both. He wanted to hurt me, or worse. I had to get away from him, fast. I grabbed my camera, and ran back to the trail. I hoped he wouldn't follow me, or that I could outrun him. I ran as fast as I could, not looking back. I heard him laugh, and then footsteps behind me. He was chasing me, and he was faster than I thought. I panicked, and tried to find a way to escape. I looked for a branch, or a rock, or anything I could use as a weapon. I didn't find anything, and he was getting closer. I reached the end of the trail, and saw the lake. I had no choice, I had to swim. I threw my camera on the ground, and jumped into the water. I hoped he wouldn't follow me, or that he couldn't swim. I swam as fast as I could, heading to the opposite shore. I felt the cold water sting my skin, and the air leave my lungs. I prayed he wouldn't catch me, or that someone would see me and help me. I looked back, and saw him standing on the shore. He was still holding his hatchet, and he was still grinning. He didn't jump into the water, he just watched me swim. He waved his hatchet, and shouted something. I couldn't hear what he said, but I guessed it wasn't good. I turned around, and kept swimming. I reached the other shore, and climbed out of the water. I was shivering and gasping, but I didn't stop. I ran to the nearest tent, and yelled for help. I hoped someone was inside, and that they would hear me. I reached the tent, and opened the flap. I saw two people inside, lying on the ground. They were covered in blood, and they weren't moving. They were dead. I screamed, and backed away from the tent. I went back the way I came and thankfully didn't see that man again. I always loved camping, especially in the wilderness of Wyoming. It was the best state for camping, according to some websites. It had plenty of free campsites, hiking trails, and natural beauty. I decided to spend a week at Wilson State Park, a public recreation area on the south shore of Wilson Lake. It was a large park, with 945 acres of land and 9,000 acres of water. It had a variety of amenities, such as showers, restrooms, picnic areas, and boat ramps. It also had several campgrounds, but I chose the primitive one, where I could pitch my tent in a secluded spot near the woods. I arrived at the park on a sunny afternoon and set up my camp. I had a small tent, a sleeping bag, a backpack, and some basic supplies. I didn't bring much food, as I planned to fish and hunt for my meals. I also had a hunting knife, a hatchet, and a rifle for protection. I was not afraid of wild animals, as I had encountered them before and knew how to deal with them. I was more worried about other people especially strangers who might wander into my camp. I had heard stories of creepy campers, serial killers, and cults in the woods. I didn't want to run into any of them. The first few days of my camping trip were uneventful. I enjoyed the peace and quiet of nature, the fresh air and water, and the scenic views of the lake and the hills. I caught some fish, shot some rabbits, and cooked them over a fire. I slept well at night, listening to the sounds of the forest. I felt relaxed and happy. On the fourth day, however, things changed. I woke up to a strange noise outside my tent. It sounded like a low, guttural growl, followed by a loud thud. I grabbed my rifle and peeked out of the zipper. 
I saw a large, black bear, standing on its hind legs, sniffing around my camp. It had knocked over my cooler and was rummaging through my food. I cursed under my breath and aimed in the air, because I didn't want to kill it, so I had to scare it away. I fired a warning shot in the air, hoping it would run off. And thankfully it did ran away. This was the scariest experience I ever had while camping, and thankfully the bear didn't hurt me. I always loved hiking alone. It gave me a sense of freedom and adventure that I couldn't find anywhere else. That's why I decided to hike the Appalachian Trail in Georgia, one of the best states for hiking. It was a 76-mile trail that crossed the Chattahoochee National Forest and the Blue Ridge Mountains. I had read that it was a moderate but scenic hike, and I was eager to explore the wilderness. I started my hike on a Monday morning, hoping to avoid the weekend crowds and enjoy the peace. The trail was well-maintained and easy to follow, and I soon found myself surrounded by the beauty of nature. The first few miles were mostly flat, but I didn't mind. I enjoyed the tranquility and the fresh air. I stopped occasionally to take pictures and admire the views. The green hills, the clear streams, and the colorful flowers were soothing. I planned to hike about 15 miles per day and camp at designated shelters along the way. I had packed enough food, water, and gear for a week. I also had a map, a compass, a phone, and a whistle. I always liked to be prepared for any situation, even though I never expected to face any trouble. I was confident and happy. I felt like I was living my dream. I hiked for about four days without any incident. I met a few other hikers on the trail, but they were friendly and respectful. I enjoyed the solitude and the challenge. I felt a sense of accomplishment and pride. I reached the halfway point of the trail on Thursday afternoon. I was amazed by the sight of the Springer Mountain, the southern terminus of the Appalachian Trail. It was a majestic peak that overlooked the forest and the valley. I felt a surge of joy and gratitude for being able to complete this journey. I decided to celebrate and have a feast before heading back. I found a nice spot near the summit, where I could enjoy the sunset and the stars. I took out my backpack and opened it. I had packed some steak, potatoes, and wine. I also had some chocolate, cookies, and coffee. I wanted to treat myself and indulge in some comfort food. I took out my stove and cooked the steak and potatoes. I poured the wine into a cup and toasted to myself. I ate and drank with gusto. I felt full and satisfied. I relaxed and enjoyed the moment. I finished my feast and decided to call my family and friends. I wanted to share my happiness and success with them. I took out my phone and turned it on. I had no signal. I frowned and moved around, hoping to find a spot with reception. I had no luck. I realized that I was in a dead zone and that I couldn't make any calls. I shrugged and decided to wait until the next day. I wasn't too worried. I knew that I would get signal again once I got off the mountain. I turned off my phone and put it back in my backpack. I decided to go to sleep. I was feeling tired and sleepy, and I thought a good rest would do me good. I laid down on the ground, using my sleeping bag and my backpack as a pillow. I closed my eyes and fell asleep. I don't know how long I slept, but I woke up with a start. I felt a sharp pain and a warm wetness on my leg. I opened my eyes and saw that it was still dark. I looked at my leg and saw that it was bleeding a bit. Nothing serious but painful. I screamed and looked around, trying to see what had attacked me. I saw a pair of glowing eyes and a snarling mouth. It was a bear. A black bear that had smelled my food and had come to investigate. It had bitten my leg and was about to attack me again. I felt a wave of terror. I realized that I was in a life-threatening situation, and that I had to fight back. I reached for my backpack, hoping to find something to defend myself. I grabbed the first thing that I felt. It was my bear spray. I sprayed it at the bear, and thankfully it ran away from there. I continued my height, and nothing bad happened again. I had always wanted to go camping in Wyoming, 
the best state of America for camping. I had heard so many stories about the beautiful scenery, the abundant wildlife, and the peaceful atmosphere. I decided to rent a cabin in Scott State Park, a 1,280-acre park that featured a stunning lake, a historic pueblo, and several hiking trails. It sounded like the perfect place to relax and enjoy nature. I arrived at the park on a sunny afternoon and checked in at the ranger station. The ranger gave me a map and a key to my cabin, which was located at the far end of the park, near the lake. He warned me that there was no cell phone service or Wi-Fi in that area, and that I should be careful of bears and other wild animals. He also told me that I was the only one staying in that cabin, and that the nearest neighbor was about a mile away. I thanked him and drove to my cabin. The cabin was small but cozy, with a wooden porch, a fireplace, and a kitchenette. It had one bedroom, a bathroom, and a living room with a sofa bed. I unpacked my bags and settled in. I decided to go for a walk around the lake before it got dark. I grabbed my camera and a bottle of water and headed out. The lake was breathtaking, with clear blue water reflecting the sky and the mountains. I saw some ducks and geese swimming on the surface, and some fish jumping out of the water. I walked along the shore, taking pictures and enjoying the fresh air. I felt so calm and happy, like I had left all my worries behind. I was about to turn back to the cabin when I noticed a small wooden sign that said, Trail to Pueblo. I was curious about the historic site, so I decided to follow the trail. It was a narrow dirt path that led into the woods. I walked for about 15 minutes, until I reached a clearing. There, I saw the ruins of an ancient stone building, surrounded by a wooden fence. It looked like it had been abandoned for centuries. I approached the fence and read a plaque that explained the history of the Pueblo. It said that it was built by the Pueblo Indians around 1200 AD, and that it was a ceremonial center and a trading post. It also said that it was the site of a massacre in 1864, when a group of soldiers attacked the Pueblo and killed most of the inhabitants. The survivors fled and never returned. The plaque ended with a warning. This is a sacred and haunted place. Respect the spirits of the dead and do not enter. I felt a chill run down my spine as I read the last sentence. I looked at the Pueblo and wondered what horrors had happened there. I felt a sudden urge to leave, but I also felt a strange attraction to the place. I wanted to see what was inside. I ignored the warning and climbed over the fence. I walked towards the entrance of the Pueblo, which was a small hole in the wall. I had to crouch down to get in. As soon as I entered I regretted my decision. It was dark and cold inside, and I could smell something rotten. I turned on the flashlight on my camera and looked around. I saw piles of bones, skulls, and pottery shards. I saw blood stains on the walls and the floor. I saw a fire pit with charred remains. I realized that I was standing in a mass grave. I felt sick and terrified. I wanted to get out of there as fast as I could. I turned around and ran towards the exit. But as I did, I heard a loud thud behind me. I looked back and saw that the entrance had collapsed. A pile of rocks and dirt had blocked the hole. I was trapped. I screamed and pounded on the wall, hoping that someone would hear me. But no one came. I was alone in the dark, with the dead. I felt a cold hand touch my shoulder. I turned around and saw a faceless figure standing behind me. It was wearing a feather headdress and a leather tunic. It was one of the Pueblo Indians. It was a ghost. It grabbed me by the neck and lifted me off the ground. I struggled and kicked, but it was too strong. It opened its mouth and let out a blood-curdling scream. I felt its teeth sink into my flesh. I felt its breath on my face. I felt its hatred in my soul. I blacked out. I don't know how long I was unconscious. When I woke up, I was lying on the ground, outside the fence. I was covered in blood and dirt. I had bite marks all over my body. I was alive, but barely. I crawled to the trail and followed it back to the lake. I saw my cabin in the distance. I saw a light on the porch. I saw a figure standing there, waiting for me. It was the ranger. He saw me and ran towards me. He helped me up and carried me to his truck. 
He drove me to the nearest hospital. He saved my life. He told me that he had come to check on me and that he had found my camera on the trail. He had looked at the pictures and had seen the one I had taken of the Pueblo. He had recognized it and had known that I was in trouble. He had gone to the Pueblo and had found the collapsed entrance. He had dug me out and had brought me back. He asked me what had happened. I told him everything. He believed me. He said that he had heard stories about the Pueblo and that he had seen things there that he couldn't explain. He said that I was lucky to be alive and that I should never go back there. I agreed. I never wanted to see that place again. I never wanted to go camping again. I never wanted to leave my home again. I survived, but I was scarred for life. I still have nightmares about the Pueblo and the ghost that attacked me. I had always wanted to go camping in Rhode Island, the best state for camping in America. I heard it had beautiful scenery, diverse wildlife, and peaceful campsites. I decided to book a spot at the outpost at Gulf State Park, a glamping site where you can sleep in a canvas tent on the sand. It sounded like the perfect getaway from the city. I arrived at the park on a sunny afternoon and checked in at the ranger station. They gave me a map and directions to my tent, which was about a mile away from the main road. They also warned me to be careful of the wildlife especially the coyotes, which had been seen roaming around the park lately. They said to keep my food in a secure container and to avoid walking alone at night. I thanked them and headed to my tent. The tent was spacious and cozy, with four beds, an outdoor sink, a porta potty and a fire pit. It was surrounded by tall grass and trees, and I could hear the waves crashing on the shore. I felt like I had the whole place to myself. I unpacked my stuff and decided to explore the park a bit. I grabbed a bottle of water and a granola bar and set off on one of the trails. The park was stunning, with rolling hills, lush forests, and sparkling lakes. I saw some deer, rabbits, and birds along the way. I also came across a small waterfall that looked like a postcard. I took some pictures and enjoyed the fresh air. I was having a great time. I lost track of time and realized it was getting dark. I checked my phone and saw that it was almost 7 p.m. I decided to head back to my tent before it got too dark. I followed the trail signs and made my way back. As I walked, I noticed that the park was eerily quiet. I didn't see or hear any other campers or rangers. I felt a bit uneasy, but I shrugged it off. I was almost at my tent. That's when I heard it. A low, guttural growl behind me. I froze and slowly turned around. There, in the shadows of the trees, was a large, dark shape. It had glowing yellow eyes and a snarling mouth. It was a coyote, and it looked hungry. I panicked and ran. I dropped my water bottle and granola bar and sprinted towards my tent. I could hear the coyote chasing me, its paws pounding on the ground. I was terrified. I reached my tent and quickly unzipped the door. I threw myself inside and zipped it back up. I hoped the coyote would leave me alone. It didn't. It scratched and bit at the tent, trying to get in. I screamed and grabbed a flashlight. I shone it at the coyote, hoping to scare it away. It didn't work. It kept attacking the tent, tearing holes in the fabric. I was trapped and helpless. I thought I was going to die. Then I heard a gunshot. The coyote yelped and ran away. I heard a voice outside. Are you okay in there? It was a ranger. He had heard my screams and came to help. He had a rifle in his hand. He had saved my life. I unzipped the tent and crawled out. I was shaking and crying. The ranger hugged me and calmed me down. He checked me for injuries and gave me some water. He told me that the coyote was gone and that I was safe. He also told me that he had called for backup and that they would take me to a safer place. He apologized for the incident and said that it was very rare. He said that I was very lucky. I thanked him and followed him to his truck. He drove me to the ranger station, where I met some other rangers and campers. They were all very kind and sympathetic. They gave me some food, clothes, and a blanket. 
They also offered me a ride to the nearest town, where I could find a hotel. I accepted their offer and packed my stuff. I was done with camping. I learned a valuable lesson that day. Camping can be fun, but it can also be dangerous. You never know what might happen in the wild. You have to be prepared and cautious. And you have to respect the wildlife. They are not your friends. They are predators. And they will not hesitate to attack you. I will never forget that night. It was the scariest night of my life. It was also the last night I ever went camping. I had always wanted to go camping in California, one of the best states in America. I had heard so many great things about its natural beauty, its diverse landscapes, and its amazing campgrounds. So when I got a chance to take a week off from work, I decided to pack my tent, my sleeping bag, and my backpack and head to the Golden State. I chose to camp at Silver Strand State Beach, a campground that offered both beach and bay camping. I thought it would be nice to have the option of swimming in the ocean or the bay, depending on the weather and the tide. I also liked the fact that the campground had fire rings, picnic tables, and showers. It seemed like a perfect place to relax and enjoy nature. I arrived at the campground in the afternoon and found a spot near the beach. The campground was not too crowded, but there were a few other campers nearby. I set up my tent, unrolled my sleeping bag, and put my backpack inside. Then I decided to take a walk along the beach and see what the ocean had to offer. The beach was beautiful, with soft sand and gentle waves. The sun was shining, and the breeze was refreshing. I walked for a while, enjoying the scenery and the sound of the water. I saw some seagulls, some crabs, and some shells. I also saw something else that caught my eye, a large wooden crate, half buried in the sand. I was curious about what was inside the crate, so I decided to dig it out. It was heavy and rusty, and it had some writing on it that I couldn't read. It looked like it had been in the water for a long time, maybe washed up from a shipwreck. I wondered if it contained some treasure, or some historical artifact, or maybe something more sinister. I managed to pry open the lid and looked inside. To my horror, I saw a human skeleton wrapped in a tattered cloth. I left right then and there and hiked back. I always loved camping, especially in the summer. That's why I was so excited when my friend Jake invited me to join him and his family for a weekend trip to Wyoming the best state in America for camping. He said they had booked a spot at the Grand Teton National Park, one of the most beautiful places in the country. I packed my tent, sleeping bag, flashlight, and some snacks, and hopped on the plane. We arrived at the park on Friday afternoon and drove to our campsite. It was a large, grassy area surrounded by pine trees and mountains. There were about a dozen other tents and RVs nearby but we still had plenty of space and privacy. Jake's dad helped us set up our tent, while his mom prepared some burgers on the grill. We ate, played some cards, and chatted with the other campers. Everyone was friendly and relaxed. It was a perfect evening. The next day, we decided to go hiking. Jake's parents stayed at the campsite, while we joined a group of other kids our age. We followed a trail that led us to a lake, where we swam and fished. Then we continued to a waterfall, where we took some pictures and enjoyed the view. The scenery was amazing, and I felt so happy and free. I wished I could stay there forever. We returned to the campsite around sunset, tired but satisfied. Jake's mom had made some chili and cornbread, which we devoured. Then we roasted some marshmallows and told stories around the campfire. Some of them were funny, some of them were scary but none of them prepared me for what was about to happen. It was around 10 p.m. when we decided to call it a night. Jake and I crawled into our tent, zipped it up, and turned off our flashlight. We talked for a while then fell asleep. I don't know how long I slept, but I woke up suddenly to a loud noise. It sounded like something heavy was dragging across the ground, right outside our tent. I froze, hoping it was just a deer or a bear. Then I heard a low, guttural growl, followed by a ripping sound. 
I felt a cold breeze on my face and realized that whatever it was had torn a hole in our tent. I screamed, and so did Jake. We grabbed our flashlight and turned it on, hoping to scare away the intruder. But what we saw made us scream even louder. It was a huge, hairy creature, with glowing red eyes, sharp teeth, and claws. It looked like a wolf, but bigger and more muscular. It was staring at us with a hungry expression, and saliva dripping from its mouth. It lunged at us, and we barely had time to react. Jake threw his flashlight at it, hoping to hit it in the eye. I grabbed my pocket knife and stabbed it in the chest. It howled in pain and backed away for a moment. We seized the opportunity and ran out of the tent. We shouted for help, hoping someone would hear us. But the campsite was silent, except for the snarls. We ran towards the nearest RV, hoping to find shelter. But as we got closer, we saw that it was empty. The door was open, so we quickly got inside and closed the door. It didn't bang on the RV or anything and we didn't see it again. I had always wanted to hike the Devil's Canyon Trail in Colorado, one of the best states for hiking. It was supposed to be a moderate loop trail that offered stunning views of the red rock formations and the canyon below. I decided to go solo, since none of my friends were available or interested in joining me. I thought it would be a fun and relaxing way to spend a sunny Saturday in late October. I drove to the trailhead early in the morning, hoping to beat the crowds and enjoy some solitude. I parked my car, grabbed my backpack, and headed to the trail. The first part of the hike was easy and pleasant, as I followed a well-marked path through the pine forest. I admired the changing colors of the leaves and the crisp air. I felt happy and free. After about an hour, I reached a junction where the loop trail split into two directions. I chose to go left, following the sign that said, Devil's Canyon Overlook. I figured it would be nice to see the canyon first, and then loop back to the forest. The trail became steeper and narrower, as it climbed up the side of the canyon. I started to sweat and breathe harder, but I didn't mind. I was enjoying the challenge and the scenery. I reached the overlook after another hour of hiking. It was worth it. The view was spectacular. I could see the deep canyon below, with its sheer cliffs and winding river. I could also see the distant mountains, snow-capped and majestic. I took out my phone and snapped some pictures. I also ate a granola bar and drank some water. I felt proud of myself for making it this far. I decided to continue the loop trail, which would take me down to the canyon floor and then back up to the forest. I followed the sign that said, Devil's Canyon Trail. The trail became even steeper and narrower as it descended into the canyon. It was also less maintained and marked, as if fewer people chose this direction. I had to be careful not to slip or trip on the loose rocks and dirt. I also had to watch out for cacti and rattlesnakes. I started to feel nervous and uneasy. I realized that I hadn't seen or heard anyone else on the trail for a long time. I checked my phone and saw that I had no signal. I checked my map and saw that I was only halfway through the loop. I wondered if I had made a mistake by going solo and choosing this trail. I wished I had someone with me, or at least a way to contact someone in case of emergency. I felt lonely and scared. I tried to calm myself down and focus on the trail. I told myself that I was fine, that I was experienced and prepared, that I would make it back to my car before dark. I told myself that it was just a hike, nothing more. I told myself that there was nothing to be afraid of. I was wrong. As I reached the bottom of the canyon, I heard a loud roar. It sounded like a wild animal, but not like any animal I had ever heard before. It sounded angry and hungry. It sounded close. I froze in fear and looked around. I saw nothing but rocks and bushes. I heard the roar again, louder and closer. I panicked and ran. I ran as fast as I could, without looking back. I ran without caring about the trail or the direction. I ran without thinking about anything but survival. I ran until I tripped and fell. I fell hard, hitting my head on a rock. I felt a sharp pain and a warm wetness. 
I saw blood on my hands and clothes. I saw stars and darkness. I saw nothing. I don't know how long I was unconscious, but when I woke up, it was dark. I was still lying on the ground, but I was completely fine. It was as if nothing had ever happened to me. But I still felt scared, so I quickly got out of there. This is the scariest experience I ever had while hiking. I had always wanted to go camping in the woods, so when my friend invited me to join him for a weekend trip, I agreed without hesitation. He said he knew a great spot in South Carolina, at Sesquicentennial State Park. He said it was one of the best states for camping, with plenty of trails, wildlife, and scenery to enjoy. We arrived at the park on a Friday afternoon and set up our tent at a campsite near the lake. The park was huge, covering over 1,400 acres of land. There were other campers around, but not too many. We had enough privacy and space to feel like we were in the wilderness. The campsite was clean and well-maintained, with access to water, toilets, and fire pits. We unpacked our gear, made a fire, and cooked some hot dogs and marshmallows. It was a perfect evening, and we talked and laughed until the stars came out. The next day, we decided to explore the park and do some hiking. We packed some snacks, water, and a map, and headed to the nearest trailhead. The park had over 12 miles of trails, ranging from easy to moderate. We chose a loop trail that circled the lake and promised to offer some scenic views. The trail was well marked and easy to follow, and we enjoyed the fresh air and the sounds of nature. We saw some birds, squirrels, and deer along the way, but nothing too exciting. We stopped at a picnic area by the lake and ate our lunch. The lake was calm and clear, reflecting the blue sky and the green trees. It was a beautiful sight, and we took some pictures to remember it. We continued our hike, and soon reached the other side of the lake. The trail became more wooded and secluded, and we didn't see any other hikers. We felt like we had the park to ourselves, and we liked it. We joked and sang songs, and had a good time. We didn't notice how late it was getting, until we saw the sun starting to set behind the trees. We checked our map, and realized we still had a few miles to go before we reached our campsite. We quickened our pace, hoping to make it back before dark. We were almost there, when we heard a loud noise in the bushes. It sounded like something big and heavy, crashing through the branches. We stopped and looked around, trying to see what it was. We hoped it was just a deer, or maybe a bear. We had heard that there were some black bears in the park, but they were usually shy and harmless. We didn't see anything, but we heard it again, closer this time. It sounded like it was coming towards us fast. We panicked and ran. We didn't know what else to do. We ran as fast as we could, following the trail, hoping to reach our campsite, or any sign of civilization. We heard it behind us, getting closer and closer. We didn't dare to look back, but we could feel its presence, its breath, its growl. We screamed, but no one heard us. We were alone, and we were prey. We ran until we couldn't run anymore. We tripped and fell, and rolled down a slope. We landed on the ground, bruised and bleeding. We looked up and saw it. It was a wolf, but not like any wolf we had ever seen. It was huge, bigger than a bear, with black fur and red eyes. It had long, sharp teeth and claws, and a scarred face. It looked like a monster, a nightmare, a beast. It looked at us, and we looked at it. We knew we were going to die. It lunged at us, and we closed our eyes. We waited for the pain, the blood, the end. But it never came. Instead, we heard a gunshot and a thud. We opened our eyes and saw the wolf lying on the ground, motionless. A bullet hole in its head. We looked around and saw a man standing over us, holding a rifle. He was wearing a park ranger uniform and had a badge on his chest. He looked at us and smiled. Are you guys okay? He asked. You're lucky I was patrolling this area. That thing has been killing campers for weeks. I've been trying to track it down, but it's been too smart and too fast. Until now. I finally got it. It's over. You're safe. 
We couldn't believe it. We were alive. We were saved. We thanked the ranger and hugged him. He helped us up and led us to his truck. He drove us to our campsite and checked our wounds. He said we were fine, just some cuts and bruises. He said he would report the incident. He said we should pack our stuff and leave the park as soon as possible. We agreed. We packed our stuff and left the park. We never went camping again.